The Library Science Department welcomes you to the final lecture of the Library Science Lecture Series for the season. Our speaker this afternoon is Mr. Kai D. Metka, a man whose ideas and leadership have made a significant impact on libraries both in this country and abroad. Mr. Metka is a graduate of Oberlin College where he began his library career as a page after completing his library science education, he began work in the New York Public Library, where he held various administrative positions, including chief of reference department. He left the New York Public Library to assume the directorship of the Harvard University Library and was retired from that position a few years ago. Fortunately, he never retired from work concerning libraries but has devoted much time and energy during the last several years to problems of academic and research library problems, both as a consultant and as a writer. A rec recent bibliography of Mr. Metcalf's writings lists over 170 items, including journal articles, reports, both official and those growing out of several library surveys, and other monographs. The most recent being his book entitled Planning for Academic and Research Library Building. We are very happy to have him here today to discuss problems in planning a new academic library building. Thank you, Ms. McCall. Ms. McCall didn't say was very pleasant and nice about it. Said I'd retired, though I'd retired last year, but I'm just finishing my 14th year of retirement because of age. I'm going to talk, as she said, about problems in planning a new academic library. I'm going to speak informally and uh, I hope I'll be careful and get through in time so you can ask me some questions. Am I talking so you can hear me all right at the back? Any of you want to come down closer will be welcome, I assure you. The subject is too complicated to uh, cover in one short session. So I'll have to just outline it. The biggest single problem in planning new academic building, uh, academic library, is the fact that the people that do it, whether they're librarians or college presidents, university presidents, or building committees, or architects, in most cases have never planned one before and it's not surprising that they run into difficulties. Uh, actually, until the great splurge of new buildings 15 years ago, during the past 15 years or so, 20 years, it very rarely happened that anyone connected with planning a new library had ever had anything to do with one before, and naturally, uh, they got into trouble. Uh, this is not so much the case today because there has been more building going on than ever before in history. And, uh, but still, the average librarian is fortunate uh, if he has, ever has an opportunity to plan or help plan more than one building. He learns something then that could be useful to him later, uh, but he never has another chance. I'm going to have a half a dozen suggestions as to things that you can do to prepare yourself for planning a library building. Uh, the first is examine the literature of the subject. That literature has become so large in recent years that I'm sure you will never, you will not try to uh, cover the whole field. Uh, be selective. Uh, pick out the material that seems to fit your situation. Uh, then there has been for 
over 20 years now, there have been planning institutes where librarians got together, talked the problems over, uh, had a, <coughs> a librarian or an architect uh, present the plans for a new building, and then uh, the librarian spoke up uh, very frankly and criticized those plans, uh, sometimes unduly severely, uh, but it set people thinking. And that's one of the things that you must do. A third suggestion is that you visit other libraries. But don't try to visit too many. I've known librarians who uh, had never planned a building before, and so they thought that they must go out and see 15 or 20 buildings, and they came back with their heads all whirling around this way, and uh, they couldn't remember uh, what they saw in one building or another. Uh, don't overdo it, and don't do too many of them, uh, one after the other. Uh, pick, if you can, a library, uh, one or two libraries of your own size. Uh, pick some that you hear are good. Uh, pick a couple that you hear have bad things about them. Uh, but uh, try to figure out what it is that you're looking for when you do visit a library. Are you interested in the furniture layout? Are you interested in the ventilation or whether they have carpets, uh, the lighting, and so on? It has been possible in recent years uh, to get consultants who have had building experience uh, to help you. Uh, if, particularly if the architect has never planned the library before, and if the librarian has never planned the library, and there's no one around the university or college that's ever planned the library, uh, it's wise to get a consultant. The difficulty has been that until the last few years, uh, it's been hard to find a consultant, and those who have undertaken the work uh, have uh, been inclined to wear themselves out, and uh, well, there are three men that have perhaps done more work than anyone else along this line. And, uh, one of them has had a number of attacks of angina, and the second one's had a stroke, and the third one has had open heart surgery uh, because they overdid. Uh, but these three men got together a few years ago and conducted an institute on building planning that lasted a week and brought to it uh, some 20 to 25 librarians and 20 to 25 uh, architects who were interested in the subject and tried to prepare them for doing consultation work. Uh, the result is that there are now uh, quite a good many men and a few women around the country who can be called in as consultants. But even if you've done, the librarian has done the followed the four suggestions that I've made, he should have help. He should organize the situation in his own institution, or someone should organize it so that he can get all the help that is uh, necessary and desirable. He can have committees help him. Uh, there are a variety of committees. Uh, you can have uh, one representing the administration, you can have one representing the faculty, and one representing the library staff, and one representing the students. If you combine them all, you're likely to have such a large committee that you don't get anywhere, but all of those groups need to be considered, and you'll have to decide in connection with the local situation whether to have one committee with one or two representatives from each of the groups, or have several committees. But I can assure you that uh, you better say to each committee, each person in the committee, that uh, they must remember that not everyone uh, can have his way. Uh, architecture is bound to be a compromise. You have people that will agree on one thing, and uh, one agree on the furniture, or one agree on the uh, uh, design, the color, use of color, and so on.
But finally, <coughs> as you get started on the job of planning a building, uh, you must do a very important thing. Arrange to have a program of your needs. Well, who writes the program? Uh, theoretically, it's better for the librarian to do it than anyone else uh, if you feel that you are in a position to do it and can learn enough from these five different methods that I've already spoken of uh, so that you can do a satisfactory uh, job in writing a program. Well, what does the program uh, consist of? It tells the architect what you want in the building. You can't plan the building. No librarian should plan the building. Uh, but he should know enough about what he wants so that the program will explain to the architect what is wanted. And then in due course it's submitted to the architect and uh, he will have an opportunity to tell you if you're biking up the wrong tree, uh, if uh, you're wrong about some of your, of your suggestions. But what does the program itself uh, consist of? Well, uh, there are three things. Uh, it tells how long you expect this building to last. Are you building for five years, or ten years, or twenty-five years, or fifty years? Uh, certainly at Ball State University, uh, you can't plan for fifty years ahead. Uh, you're changing too rapidly. I would hope that you would choose a site that where the building could be planned so that it could be added to and still uh, get along on the site that you would plan a building uh, that you could add to. This is uh, very important. But the architect has to have some idea as to how long you're planning to have the building uh, continue to be useful. I might say that it's possible, ought to be possible today, in spite of the uncertainty about the future of libraries, to plan a building that will last longer than we did 50 years ago, because then we built uh, fixed function buildings where you couldn't move things around. Uh, two buildings that I've spent most of my life in had walls, not only outside walls, but interior walls, three feet thick, uh, all around practically every room nothing you can do about it uh, to change space assignments. The next thing that you need to put in the program is what facilities you want in it to give the architect some idea of the amount of space that will be required. Well, you certainly in an academic library must provide space for the users, the students, the faculty, but how many? Well, this is very difficult, particularly with our new universities, because uh, how many students are you going to have 25 years from now, if you're planning for 25 years? Uh, and uh, even more difficult, what percentage of them do you need to take care of at one time? I know universities in our large cities, commuting universities, where they've never provided more than 5% more than five percent of the students in all their libraries, even if they had a number of departmental libraries, more than 5% altogether. I've known others that have found the need of providing over 50%. What kind of an institution are you? This is a very difficult thing to decide. Readers take more space in the library, than readers and service to readers, than anything else. So this is the most difficult an important problem to answer. Next, uh, how many books, how many volumes are you going to have to have uh, by the end of the period that you're building for? Well, that's uh, perhaps simpler than how many readers, but uh, we don't know what volumes are going to be like in the years ahead. Uh, we do know that in the past, libraries have increased in the size of their collections. Uh, they've doubled or in the last 150 years, academic libraries, on the average, are once in 16 years. Uh, that can't go on forever. Uh, if Harvard University, with over 8 million volumes, would double every 
16 years, uh, you can imagine what would happen. Uh, you might be able in position be able to do that for a while. Then what about the staff and the service that you get? The staff uh, costs a lot of money to buy books, but it costs more money to pay the staff than it does to buy the books in most institutions. And that percentage is likely uh, not to change in the years ahead. How many service desks are you going to provide? Uh, we say, used to say at Harvard when I was there, that for every additional service desk that is made necessary by the planning of the library, it means one less full professor in the institution. So uh, try to plan so you don't have to use any unnecessary service desks to keep open. Uh, then what special facilities are you going to provide? You're going to provide for books and readers and staff, but what else? Are you going to have a classroom? Are you going to have an auditorium? Are you going to have a rare book room or a math room or audiovisual work? Uh, a lot of faculty studies. Uh, you've got to decide those matters in early in the procedure as possible. And then finally, don't forget that after you've provided for all of these things that I've mentioned, uh, the architect has to have more space, what we call non-assignable space, space for the walls, for the stairs, the toilets, the entrance lobbies, the elevators, uh, the machinery, and so on. And uh, you know, when the big Widener Library at Harvard was built uh, 54 years ago, about 55% of the building was non-assignable space. Today we try to get that down to less than 30 percent. That makes a good deal of difference in the cost and in other things. And then <coughs> there's still another factor to be kept in mind in the program. Now what about things that affect the cost of the building? Are you going to use your space to the best advantage or are you going to build a monument and uh, have it like the Widener Library at Harvard that I spoke of. Uh, what style of architecture do you want? Or are you ready to leave that to the architect? This is something that the university, the college, must decide. Probably the librarian should not. Are you going to build a building of the highest quality with the best possible ventilation and lighting? Or are you ready to be satisfied with uh, an inexpensive building? on the basis that it'll wear out in 25 years and we don't know what we'll need 25 years from now and so you'll throw it away at that time. Someone must make a decision in that connection. <coughs> are you going to have carpets on the floor? What kind of floors uh, do you want? Uh, do you want high rooms? Uh, 30 years ago we thought all reading rooms, or 40 years ago, that all reading rooms had to be 20 or 25 feet high. Uh, today, uh, we're building libraries with the ceilings, no ceilings, more than eight and a half or nine feet high. And you don't have to have all the building with the same height ceiling. Uh, another important feature, uh, what do you want on the entrance level? What should the spatial relationships be within the building? Uh, this is very important. Uh, if you're going to make it convenient, building, one that's easy to use. But in addition to these items that I've already spoken of, there are a number of basic decisions that you must make. Uh, before you get very far, you ought to decide, perhaps it's possible not to build a new building at all, but to add to the old building or to make changes in the old building if you have an old building, uh, so that uh, it will be adequate for some years to come. Sometimes this is possible, sometimes it's not possible. <coughs> I've known of universities that have had to build, uh, had, well, I can think of one that in 18, uh, 1952 built a new building, the largest building on the campus, the finest building, and in seven years, it had outgrown it and found that it couldn't add to it. It had to start over again. 
we started over again and picked the site uh, that had already been outgrown and they're now at work on the third building, all within 17 years. I hope you won't run anything of that kind. But do figure out whether you can get along in your present building or not and whether it will save you money. <coughs> Many times it would be possible to add to an old building, but it would cost you more than it would be worth. And then you must decide what you're going to do about supervision in the building. Are you going to check people at the doors? A generation ago, we never thought of checking people at the doors, except the New York Public Library where I was working, and when that building was opened in 1911, we began to check people as they came in and out. But most academic libraries have found <coughs> that it was necessary. The larger the city that the institution is in, probably the more important it is uh, to control it. Uh, do you supervise the reading rooms? Although I said we didn't control the entrance uh, 50 years ago, we always had uh, a desk in the reading room, uh, supposedly to keep the boys and girls in order. Uh, not that they got up and uh, fought and uh, did some of the things that they've been doing in uh, recent years, uh, but they talked and whispered and the room got noisy. Now, we've given up that now because students today seem to be serious enough uh, so that they uh, behave uh, better in one way if not uh, in another. Is your stack going to be open or closed? When I started in library work, there were very few book stacks in academic libraries that were open to the students. Faculty could go in, if you had graduate students, they could get permission to go. Uh, but this is an decision that you need to make before the building can be properly planned, or you may, well, the Widener Library is planned with about 25 different entrances to the stack. Uh, they're all controlled now. Uh, not all 25, because most of them are kept locked. Uh, are you going to permit non-library activities in the building? Uh, there's a tendency, has been a tendency in recent years, uh, since we didn't want to waste money, uh, to plan a building large enough to last you for 15, 20, 25 years. Uh, but if you're doubling every 16 years, half of it isn't going to be used for some time. And we put other things in. Then you may get into trouble because the librarian can't push the others out uh, when space is needed for the library. But it's easier to get a large enough library if you're willing to do that. But this is a decision that you should make and have to make before the plans can get very far along. Now what kind of seating are you going to provide? Are you going to have great reading rooms such as we have had until recent years, or will most of the seating be in carrels, and will the carrels be mixed up with the books, or in large reading rooms? Are you going to provide comfortable chairs, or just uh, regular library chairs? What are you going to do about smoking? This is uh, an important decision because it affects the ventilation. And uh, if you're going to permit smoking throughout, uh, you've got to provide different ventilation than if you don't. Uh, some libraries permit smoking everywhere. Some libraries don't permit smoking at all. Some of them permit smoking in certain areas, adjusting the ventilation to match. Are you going to have a divisional plan? Uh, quite a few university libraries in recent years have had four libraries within one building. Uh, it started at Nebraska and uh, Colorado. Uh, Colorado, uh, they had one uh, general library, uh, one for science, one for social sciences, and one for the humanities. The difficulty was that the books in each one grew at a different rate, and uh, the stack was not adjusted so that they could take care of it. When they made an addition, built an addition a few years ago, they were able to straighten part of it out. Uh, at the University of Nebraska, they've used the divisional plan and really have four separate libraries, four library uh, 
separate groups of catalogers, and order department people, and reference, and so on. That costs more money, but it has its advantages. But don't forget what you're going to do about future growth. I can't overemphasize this. And this is going to have a good deal to do with the site that you select. Don't pick a site uh, where you will be stuck for space at a later time. Now this program, this is all the program I'm talking about, uh, theoretically you're doing it for the architect. Actually, uh, it's just about as important. You do it for the library staff itself so you'll find out what your needs are. You probably haven't any idea what you need until you try to figure it out. Uh, it also uh, is for the university, the college itself, to find out what it needs and to agree that it does need it. You don't want to ask for more than you can get, and you don't, but you want to ask for enough. And uh, if the program is examined by all the people concerned, all the persons concerned, uh, you can get, ought to be easier uh, to find the funds because everyone will be back at you. Sooner or later, the architect should be selected, and if you're going to have a consultant, uh, he should be selected. Uh, the consultant, if you're completely green uh, on the task, may be able to help you with the program. Uh, the librarian ought to write the program, but the consultant can ask the questions that need to be answered. But the selection of the architect is also uh, important. You can get a big name architect, and many of our universities have been doing that, someone that will build an exciting building. Uh, it often will cost more, than if you get another person uh, who uh, is more likely to do just what you want him to do, but it won't be as distinguished a building, perhaps. You certainly want someone who has an imagination and who wants to do more than just build a factory. You want someone, I hope, who will listen to what you have to say. He doesn't have to accept everything you say, uh, but he ought to accept it to tell you why not. will be better off if you select someone who has a staff uh, who can get the job done uh, with the aid of the chief architect within a short time. Uh, if you can get someone who has knowledge of the local situation, uh, that will help. Someone who knows about the local building codes. I've known too many cases of buildings that were plan accepted by the university uh, without and then it was found that uh, the inspectors the local inspectors wouldn't pass it and you were in trouble but finally you get your program written uh, the architect has seen it and you have to go ahead with the building I would suggest that you ought to spend at least six months uh, preparing the program. Couldn't do any harm to spend a year if you weren't too pushed for space. I would suggest that the architect will do better if you give him a year uh, to do the basic design. That doesn't mean that he's working on it full time for a year, but he makes suggestions and sends them on to you and you criticize them and uh, you play it back and forth and you'll get a better building if you don't push too rapidly. It takes time to think of all the complicated things that need to be considered. Then, unless the architect has a tremendously large staff, it will probably take him at least six months to uh, prepare the working drawings and specifications. So altogether, this is two years before uh, you go out for bids. And then, if it's a big building, 
it may take two years to build. So get at your building planning as early as you can. If the bids come in too high, what do you do with them? This is another pretty problem. Uh, do you reduce the quality or reduce the size? It's hard to... You don't like to reduce the quality. It's easy to find ways to do it. Uh, you can uh, cut down on the lighting. <coughs> you can cut down on the ventilation. Uh, you can have cheap floors instead of carpet or whatever you decide you want to have. There are lots of ways of doing it, but be sure that you know what you are doing uh, when you cut down. Uh, if you reduce the size, uh, you have another problem. Uh, the easiest thing to do is simply say, well, we want to have room for so many readers and so many books. The other things will have to be as they are. I was called over to Tasmania a few years ago because uh, they had to cut their building in two the last minute and uh, they cut it in two.